I never imagined my wedding day would be the start of a war. But there I was, standing in my pristine white gown, face to face with Eloise Hemingway, my new mother-in-law and self-appointed nemesis. Claire, dear, Eloise said, her voice dripping with false sweetness. That dress is interesting. I suppose it's the best you could do on such short notice. I forced a smile, determined not to let her ruin this day. Thank you for your concern, Eloise. John and I are just happy to be married. Yes, well, she sniffed, eyeing me critically. I do hope you'll grow into the role of a professor's wife. It's not an easy position, you know. Before I could respond, John appeared at my side, his hand warm on my back. Mother, please, this is our wedding day. Eloise's eyes narrowed. I'm merely offering advice, John. Someone needs to guide this girl. I'm thirty-two, Eloise, I said, my patience wearing thin. Hardly a girl. Age doesn't equal wisdom, dear, she retorted. John sighed. Let's not do this now. Claire, shall we greet the other guests? I nodded, grateful for the escape. As we moved away, I heard Eloise mutter, This marriage is a mistake. Mark my words. Little did I know how prophetic those words would become. Six months later, I found myself in the Hemingway's lavish living room, surrounded by antiques that probably cost more than my yearly salary as a social worker. John sat beside me, his posture stiff and uncomfortable. Eloise perched on her favorite armchair, looking every inch the queen on her throne. So, Claire, she began, her tone deceptively light. When can we expect grandchildren? I choked on my tea. We're not quite ready for that yet, Eloise. Her lips thinned. You're not getting any younger, dear, and John needs an heir. Mother, John warned, but she waved him off. I'm just being practical. You two have been married for months now. Surely you've discussed this? I set my cup down with a clatter. Our family planning is private, Eloise. She leaned forward, eyes glinting. Nothing is private in this family, Claire. The sooner you learn that, the better. That's enough, John said firmly. Our decisions are our own. Eloise's gaze swiveled to her son. You used to value my opinion, John. What's changed? I grew up, he replied coolly. The tension in the room was palpable. Walter, John's father, who had been silent until now, cleared his throat. Perhaps we should change the subject. Claire, how's work? Grateful for the lifeline, I launched into a story about a recent case, but Eloise wasn't finished. Social work, she interrupted. Such a quaint profession. Wouldn't you rather focus on supporting John's career? I felt my cheeks burn. My work is important to me, Eloise. I help people. And John doesn't, she countered. That's not what I... You know, Eloise continued, her voice sharp. When John brought you home, I thought, well, at least she's pretty. But beauty fades, dear. What will you offer our family then? The room fell silent. I stared at her, shocked by the blatant cruelty. John stood abruptly. We're leaving. Mother, this behavior is unacceptable. Eloise's eyes widened in feigned innocence. I'm only trying to help. As we gathered our things, I caught Walter's apologetic gaze. He mouthed, I'm sorry, as we headed for the door. Outside, John pulled me close. I'm so sorry, Claire. I never thought she'd go this far. I leaned into him, fighting back tears. What are we going to do? He sighed heavily. I don't know, but we'll figure it out together. As we drove home, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning. Eloise had declared war, and I was woefully unprepared for battle. But one thing was certain. I wasn't going down without a fight. The morning after our disastrous visit to the Hemingways, I woke up determined to make things right. Maybe if I extended an olive branch, Eloise would see me differently. I dialed Linda's number, desperate for advice. You're doing what? Linda's voice crackled through the phone. Claire, honey, that woman is toxic. I sighed, pacing our small kitchen. I know, but she's John's mother. I have to try. And what does John think about this? I glanced at our closed bedroom door. He's still asleep. I haven't told him yet. Linda's exasperation was palpable. Claire, you can't keep shouldering this alone. John needs to step up. He will, I insisted, though doubt gnawed at me. I just, I need to do this first. After hanging up, I spent the morning baking Eloise's favorite lemon bars. As I pulled them from the oven, John stumbled into the kitchen, bleary-eyed. What's all this? he asked, eyeing the treats. I took a deep breath. I'm going to see your mother today. Try to smooth things over. John's face darkened. Claire, no. After what she said yesterday. I have to try, I interrupted. For us, for our future. He ran a hand through his hair, frustration evident. We're all fine, but I'm coming with you. 
An hour later, we stood on the Hemingway's doorstep. Walter answered, surprise etched on his face. Claire, John, we weren't expecting you. I held up the lemon bars, forcing a smile. Surprise visit, is Eloise home? Walter ushered us in, his eyes darting nervously. She's in the sunroom, but I should warn you. Before he could finish, Eloise's voice rang out. Walter, who is it? We rounded the corner to find Eloise perched in her favorite chair, felt a young woman seated across from her. The stranger turned, revealing a striking resemblance to John. Eloise's eyes narrowed. What are you two doing here? John stepped forward, confusion evident. Mother, who's this? The young woman stood, extending her hand. I'm Sarah, your cousin from Boston. Aunt Eloise invited me to stay for a while. I felt the blood drain from my face. Cousin? John had never mentioned a cousin from Boston. Eloise's lips curled into a smug smile. Sarah's considering a teaching position at the university. I thought she and John could catch up. The implication was clear. Sarah was everything I wasn't poised, educated, from the right family. My peace offering suddenly felt pathetic. We brought lemon bars, I said weakly, holding out the container. Eloise waved dismissively. How thoughtful. Sarah, dear, why don't you and John take a walk in the garden, catch up on old times? John hesitated, glancing between me and Sarah. I don't think. Nonsense, Eloise interrupted. Claire and I can chat here. Go on. To my dismay, John allowed himself to be led away, leaving me alone with Eloise. As soon as they were out of earshot, her demeanor changed. Did you really think some baked goods would fix this? She hissed. I straightened my spine. I'm trying here, Eloise. Why can't you meet me halfway? She leaned forward, eyes glinting. Because you don't belong in this family, Claire. You never will. Sarah, on the other hand. John loves me, I said, but my voice wavered. Eloise's smile was cold. For now— but love fades. Family, tradition, those are forever. I stood abruptly. I should go. Yes, you should, Eloise agreed. And Claire? Next time, call before you visit. It's only proper. I fled the house, tears stinging my eyes. Outside I caught a glimpse of John and Sarah, heads bent close in conversation. The sight sent a jolt of fear through me. As I drove home alone, Linda's words echoed in my mind. I couldn't keep doing this by myself. Something had to change. But as I pulled into our driveway, one question haunted me. Was I fighting to save my marriage? Or was I fighting a battle I'd already lost? I should have known better than to agree to this vacation. But when Walter suggested a family trip to their beach house, John's eyes lit up with nostalgia. Even Eloise seemed less combative than usual. So against my better judgment, I packed my bags and hoped for the best. The first day wasn't terrible. We arrived late afternoon— the salty air a welcome change from the city. John and I settled into our room while Eloise and Walter took the master suite. See? John said, wrapping his arms around me. This might be good for us. I wanted to believe him, but doubt nagged at me. What about your work? I thought you had that important meeting. He kissed my forehead. I'll have to leave a day early, but it's worth it for some family time. Family time. The phrase left a bitter taste in my mouth. Dinner that evening was tense but civil. Eloise kept her barbs to a minimum, though her eyes followed my every move. As we cleared the table, Walter pulled me aside. Claire, he said quietly, I know things have been difficult, but Eloise is trying. Give her a chance. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. If only he knew how much I'd already tried. The next morning, disaster struck. John received an urgent call from the university. I have to go, he said, throwing clothes into his suitcase. The dean needs me for an emergency meeting. Panic rose in my throat. Now? But we just got here. He looked torn. I'm sorry, Claire. I'll be back as soon as I can. And just like that, he was gone, leaving me alone with my in-laws. Eloise's smug expression said it all. Well, she mused, I suppose we'll have to make the best of it. The day dragged on endlessly. I tried to lose myself in a book on the beach, but Eloise's constant hovering made it impossible to relax. You really should wear more sunscreen, dear, she chided. Your skin isn't used to this sun. I bit back a retort, reminding myself of Walter's plea for patience. As evening approached, Walter announced he was heading into town for supplies. Anyone want to join me? I jumped at the chance to escape, but Eloise beat me to it. I'll come, darling. Claire can get started on dinner. Left alone in the beach house, I tried to focus on cooking. But as I rummaged through the fridge, a realization hit me. There wasn't enough food for four people. 
In fact, there was barely enough for three. My hands shook as I dialed John's number. No answer. I tried Walter next. Claire? His voice crackled through the speaker. Is everything all right? Walter, I said, fighting to keep my voice steady. Did you know there's only enough food here for three people? A long pause followed. Oh, dear, he finally said. I thought Eloise had taken care of that. The pieces fell into place with sickening clarity. This wasn't an oversight. It was deliberate. When Eloise and Walter returned, I was waiting. There's no room for me here, is there? I asked, my voice surprisingly calm. Eloise's eyes narrowed. Whatever do you mean? The food, Eloise? The sleeping arrangements? This whole trip, it was never meant for four people. Walter looked stricken. Claire, I'm sure there's been a misunderstanding. No misunderstanding, I cut in. This was your plan all along, wasn't it, Eloise? Get John away, then make it clear I don't belong. For once, Eloise seemed at a loss for words, but her silence spoke volumes. I grabbed my bag, already packed. I'm leaving. Tell John. Tell him he has a choice to make. As I drove away, tears blurring my vision, I realized this was more than just a family squabble. This was war. And for the first time, I was ready to fight back. My phone buzzed with a text from Linda. How's the vacation? I pulled over, my hands shaking as I typed a reply. It's over, and so is my patience. I need your help. The battle lines were drawn. Eloise had made her move. Now it was my turn. I never expected a simple video to change everything. But as I sat in Linda's living room watching my humiliation play out on her laptop screen, I realized nothing would ever be the same. Oh my God, Claire, Linda gasped, her hand covering her mouth. I can't believe she did this to you. The video, taken by another beachgoer, showed Eloise in all her cruel glory. Her voice, dripping with disdain, echoed through the speakers. Well, dear, it seems there's no room for you here. Perhaps it's a sign you don't quite fit in our family. My cheeks burned with shame as I watched myself on screen, fighting back tears and fumbling with my luggage. The clip ended with Eloise's smug smile as I drove away. It's gone viral, Linda said softly, scrolling through the comments. People are outraged on your behalf. I buried my face in my hands. This is a nightmare. What am I going to do? Before Linda could answer, my phone exploded with notifications. Texts from colleagues, emails from local news stations, and worst of all, a voicemail from John. With shaking hands, I played the message. Claire, what the hell is going on? Mom's hysterical, Dad won't stop apologizing, and I'm getting calls from the university about some video. Call me back. Now. I looked at Linda, panic rising in my chest. I can't face him. Not yet. She squeezed my hand. You don't have to, but Claire, people are on your side. This could be an opportunity. An opportunity for what? I asked, bewildered. To make a difference. To speak out against emotional abuse and family bullying. Your story is resonating with so many people. As if on cue, my work phone rang. It was my supervisor at the social services department. Claire, she said, her voice unusually gentle. I've seen the video. I'm so sorry for what you're going through but I have a proposition for you. She explained that a local women's shelter was looking for a spokesperson for their new campaign against family abuse. They wanted me. Your experience, combined with your professional background, makes you perfect for this, my supervisor continued. It's a chance to turn this awful situation into something positive. I felt a spark of hope for the first time in days. Can I think about it? Of course, but don't take too long. The media attention won't last forever. After hanging up, I turned to Linda. What should I do? She smiled encouragingly. I think you already know the answer. Just then, another call came through. John again. This time I answered. Claire, where are you? He, he demanded. We need to talk about this. I took a deep breath, stealing myself. Yes, we do. But not yet. He's with- I need time to think. Think about what? His voice rose. This video is destroying our family. Our family. I repeated, a sudden clarity washing over me. John, your mother has been destroying me for months. Where were you then? His silence spoke volumes. I'll be home tomorrow, I said firmly. We'll talk then. But right now, I need to decide what I'm going to do about this situation. What you're going to do, he echoed, confusion evident in his tone. Yes, John, what I'm going to do. For once, this isn't about your mother or you or fitting into your family. This is about me. I ended the call, feeling a strange mix of terror and exhilaration. Linda beamed at me. So, she said, what's the plan? 
I squared my shoulders, a decision crystallizing in my mind. First, I'm going to call my supervisor back. Then we're going to draft a statement. It's time the world heard my side of the story. As we got to work, I realized this wasn't just about standing up to Eloise anymore. It was about finding my voice and using it to help others who had been silenced for too long. The war wasn't over, but for the first time I felt like I might actually win. The day I returned home, our quiet suburban street was lined with news vans. Reporters swarmed our front yard, shouting questions as I made my way to the door. John met me in the entryway, his face a mask of worry and frustration. Claire, this is insanity, he said, pulling me inside. We need to do something. I took a deep breath, stealing myself. I am doing something, John. I've agreed to be a spokesperson for the women's shelter. His eyes widened in disbelief. What? Without talking to me first? Before I could respond, a commotion outside caught our attention. Through the window, I saw Eloise and Walter pushing through the crowd of reporters. John groaned. They've been staying here, he explained. Mom's a wreck. She can't go home because of all the negative attention. My heart sank. Of course, Eloise had managed to make herself the victim in all this. As they entered, Eloise's eyes locked onto mine. For a moment, I saw a flicker of something, fear, perhaps, before her usual mask of disdain slipped into place. Well, she said, her voice brittle, I hope you're happy now, Claire. You've ruined our family's reputation. I felt a surge of anger. I ruined it? You're the one who— Enough. John interrupted. We need to fix this. Claire, you have to tell everyone it was a misunderstanding. I stared at him, incredulous. A misunderstanding? John, did you even watch the video? Walter cleared his throat. Oh, perhaps we could all sit down and discuss this calmly. We moved to the living room, the tension palpable. I perched on the edge of the sofa, feeling outnumbered. Claire, Walter began gently. We understand you were upset, but surely we can find a way to move past this, for the sake of the family. I looked at each of them in turn, Walter's pleading eyes, Eloise's tight-lipped scowl, John's conflicted expression. Suddenly I felt very alone. The sake of the family, I repeated slowly. And what about my sake? What about all the other women out there dealing with emotional abuse from their in-laws? Eloise scoffed. Abuse? Don't be so dramatic. Something inside me snapped. I pulled out my phone and played the video, forcing them all to watch. Eloise's cruel words filled the room followed by my own choked sobs. When it ended, silence reigned. John looked pale, Walter ashamed. But Eloise, Eloise looked furious. You ungrateful little, she began. You but John cut her off. Mom, stop. His voice was quiet but firm. You need to apologize to Claire. Now. Eloise's mouth opened and closed like a fish out of water. Apologize? But I... Now, Eloise, Walter echoed, surprising us all. What followed was perhaps the most insincere apology I'd ever heard. Eloise's words were correct, but her tone dripped with resentment. As she finished, she looked at John expectantly. There, it's done. Now tell her to fix this mess. I waited for John to defend me, to stand up to his mother once and for all. But he just looked torn, his gaze darting between us. In that moment, I realized nothing had really changed. Despite the video, despite the public outcry, I was still alone in this fight. I stood up, my decision made. I'm not fixing anything, Eloise. In fact, I'm going to do an interview tomorrow. I'm going to tell my story and hopefully help other women in similar situations. John reached for my hand. Claire, please, think about what this will do to us. I pulled away, feeling a strange mix of sadness and determination. I have thought about it, John. I've thought about nothing else. And I've realized something important. What's that? he asked, his voice barely a whisper. I looked at each of them in turn, my voice steady. I've realized that I deserve better than this. Better than all of you. With that, I walked out of the room, leaving them in stunned silence. As I closed the bedroom door behind me, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders. Tomorrow would bring new challenges, but for the first time in months, I felt ready to face them. The war wasn't over, but I had finally chosen my side. My own. The morning of my interview dawned bright and clear, a stark contrast to the storm brewing inside our home. As I dressed, I could hear John and Eloise arguing downstairs, their voices rising with each passing minute. You have to stop her, John, Eloise shrieked. She'll destroy everything we've built. I took a deep breath, stealing myself for the confrontation to come. When I entered the kitchen, three pairs of eyes turned to me. 
John's pleading, Eloise's furious, and Walter's resigned. Claire, John began, his voice strained, please reconsider this interview. We can find another way to handle this. I shook my head firmly. No, John, I'm done hiding. I'm done being the victim. Eloise slammed her hand on the table. Victim, you ungrateful little witch. After everything we've done for you. That's enough. John's shout startled us all. He turned to his mother, eyes blazing. Mom, if you can't control yourself, you need to leave, now. For a moment, silence reigned. Then Eloise's face crumpled, tears welling in her eyes. My own son, she whimpered, choosing her over his family. I watched, stunned, as John's resolve visibly wavered. Walter stepped in, gently guiding Eloise towards the door. Come on, dear, let's get some air. As they left, John turned to me, his expression a mix of anger and desperation. Is this what you wanted, Claire? To tear our family apart? His words hit me like a physical blow. John, I... But before I could finish, my phone buzzed. Linda's text flashed on the screen. I'm outside, ready when you are. I looked back at John, suddenly realizing the chasm that had opened between us. I have to go, I said softly. He didn't try to stop me. The ride to the TV station was a blur. Linda's reassurances washed over me as I tried to calm my racing heart. This was it. My chance to speak my truth, to help others who might be suffering in silence. As we entered the studio, a flurry of activity surrounded us. Makeup artists, sound technicians, producers, all buzzing around, preparing for the live interview. You've got this, Claire, Linda whispered, squeezing my hand before being ushered to the side. I took my seat across from the interviewer, a kind-faced woman named Sarah. As the countdown began, I closed my eyes, centering myself. And we're live in three, two, one. Sarah's voice was warm as she introduced me, briefly recapping the viral video that had brought me here. Then, with a gentle smile, she asked, Claire, can you tell us about your relationship with your mother-in-law? I took a deep breath, ready to pour out my heart. But as I opened my mouth to speak, a commotion erupted off camera. Stop the interview! Eloise's voice rang out, shrill and desperate. My head snapped up to see Eloise pushing past security guards, John and Walter hot on her heels. The studio erupted into chaos. You can't let her speak, Eloise cried, pointing at me accusingly. She's lying. She's trying to ruin us. John reached for his mother, his face a mask of shock and embarrassment. Mom, stop. You can't. But Eloise was beyond reason. She lunged towards me, eyes wild. I'll show you what real family loyalty means, you home-wrecking. Security finally reached her, restraining her flailing arms. As they dragged her away, her shrieks echoed through the studio. I sat frozen, the camera still rolling, capturing every moment of this surreal scene. Sarah looked at me, her professional composure cracking. Claire, are you all right? I stared at her, then at John, who stood rooted to the spot, looking utterly lost. In that moment, I realized the true cost of speaking out. This wasn't just about me anymore. This was about every person who had ever felt silenced, every family torn apart by toxic behavior. With a clarity I hadn't felt in months, I turned back to the camera. My voice, when it came, was steady and strong. No, I said, I'm not all, but I will be, and that's why I'm here today. As I began to tell my story, I knew there was no going back. Whatever came next, I was ready to face it, head on. The aftermath of the disastrous TV interview hit like a tsunami. My phone buzzed incessantly with messages from friends, colleagues, and strangers alike. Some offered support, others condemnation. But it was the deafening silence from John that hurt the most. I threw myself into my work at the women's shelter, desperate for a sense of purpose. The director, Maria, approached me one afternoon, her eyes gleaming with excitement. Claire, We've received an unprecedented number of donations since your interview, she said, and more women are coming forward seeking help. You've made a real difference. I should have felt elated, but the weight of my crumbling personal life overshadowed any sense of accomplishment. That's wonderful. I managed, forcing a smile. As I left the shelter that evening, a familiar figure waited by my car. John. We need to talk, he said, his voice tight with emotion. Back at our house, no longer feeling like home, we sat across from each other at the kitchen table. The distance between us felt insurmountable. I've been thinking, John began, his eyes not quite meeting mine, about everything that's happened. About us. My heart raced. Was this it? The moment our marriage finally shattered beyond repair? I'm sorry, he continued, surprising me. I should have stood up for you sooner. 
protected you from mom's behavior. Relief washed over me, quickly followed by a surge of anger. Why didn't you? He sighed heavily. I thought, I thought if I just kept the peace, everything would work out. I was wrong. As we talked, really talked, for the first time in months, I felt a glimmer of hope. Maybe we could salvage this after all. But our tentative reconciliation was short-lived. The next morning, as I prepared for a meeting at the shelter, John received a call that changed everything. It's Dad, he said, his face pale. Mom's in the hospital. She... she tried to hurt herself. The world seemed to tilt on its axis. Despite everything, I never imagined Eloise would go this far. At the hospital, we found Walter slumped in a waiting room chair, looking older than I'd ever seen him. She left a note, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. She blamed herself for ruining the family, for pushing you away, Claire. Guilt crashed over me like a wave. Had I pushed too hard? Gone too far in my quest for justice? John squeezed my hand. This isn't your fault, he murmured, but doubt had already taken root. As we waited for news, my phone buzzed. It was Maria from the shelter. Claire, I hate to bother you, but there's a situation. A woman saw your interview and left her abusive husband. She needs a safe place, but we're at capacity. I thought, given your experience, I froze, torn between my duty to help and my obligation to my family, however dysfunctional it might be. John overheard the conversation. Go, he said softly. You can help her. I'll stay here with Dad. I hesitated, searching his face for any sign of resentment. Finding none, I nodded and stood. As I reached the door, John called out, Claire? I turned back, my hand on the doorknob. I'm proud of you, he said, for everything you're doing. But where does this leave us? The question hung in the air between us, heavy with implications. I realized I didn't have an answer. My world had expanded beyond the confines of our marriage, beyond the toxic dynamic with Eloise. I was making a difference, helping others, finding my voice. But at what cost? I don't know, I admitted, my voice barely audible. I just... I don't know. As I walked away, leaving John in that sterile hospital corridor, I felt like I was standing on the edge of a precipice. Behind me lay the familiar, a marriage built on compromise and silence. Ahead, an unknown future, full of possibility but also uncertainty. The choice was mine. But for the first time I wasn't sure which path to take. Six months after Eloise's hospitalization, I found myself standing outside her rehabilitation center, my heart pounding. John squeezed my hand reassuringly. You don't have to do this, he said softly. I took a deep breath. Yes, I do. We entered to find Eloise sitting by the window, looking smaller and more fragile than I'd ever seen her. When she turned and saw us, her eyes widened with surprise. Claire? Her voice was barely above a whisper. I didn't think you'd come. I sat across from her, acutely aware of the tension in the room. I almost didn't, I admitted, but I realized something important. This cycle of hurt and resentment, it has to stop. Eloise's eyes filled with tears. I've had a lot of time to think, she said, about the kind of person I've been, the pain I've caused. I'm so sorry, Claire, for everything. Her words, so long awaited, washed over me. But instead of the vindication I'd expected to feel, I felt only a profound sadness for the years we'd lost. I'm sorry, too, I said, surprising myself. I could have tried harder to understand you, to find common ground. John, who had been silent until now, spoke up. We all made mistakes. But maybe... maybe it's not too late to start over? As we talked, really talked, for the first time, I felt a shift in the air. It wasn't forgiveness, not yet, but it was a start. Leaving the center, I felt lighter than I had in years. But there was one more thing I needed to do. At home, I called Linda. I've made a decision, I told her, about the book deal and the speaking tour. You're going to do it, she asked excitedly. I took a deep breath. No, I'm turning it down. There was a pause. Claire, are you sure? This could be huge for your career. I know, I said. But I've realized something. My story isn't just mine anymore. It belongs to Eloise, too, and John and Walter— and I don't want to keep reliving the past. I want to move forward. After hanging up, I found John in our study. He looked up as I entered, his eyes questioning. I turned down the book deal, I said. He stood, surprise evident on his face. Claire, you don't have to do that for us, for me. I shook my head, smiling. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for me. I want to help people, but not by rehashing old wounds. I want to create something new. John's eyes softened. 
What do you have in mind? I told him about my idea, a support group for families dealing with internal conflicts, a place where both sides could come together and heal. As I spoke, I saw the spark of understanding in John's eyes. That's, that's incredible, Claire. And I want to help if you'll let me. In that moment, looking at my husband, I felt a surge of love and hope. We'd been through hell, but we'd come out stronger, not just as individuals, but as a team. The next day, as I stood before the group at the women's shelter, I felt a sense of peace I hadn't experienced in years. My name is Claire, I began, and I want to tell you about resilience, about forgiveness, and about the power of second chances. As I shared my story, not just the pain, but the healing too, I saw recognition in the eyes of the women before me. They weren't just hearing my words, they were seeing possibilities for their own lives. Later, as John and I walked hand in hand through the park, I reflected on the journey that had brought us here. The pain, the growth, the unexpected turns. You know, I said, squeezing his hand, I think we're going to be okay. John smiled, pulling me close. More than okay, we're going to be extraordinary. And as the sun set on another day, I knew he was right. Our story wasn't over. It was just beginning.